This is the first Seed Talk of 2018, and I am super excited to uh, bring Zach out and to introduce these amazing women. And when we started talking about what we could do in 2018, the big question for us was how do we bring our activism into this dialogue? I think it's an important part of what we do as artists, and it's an important part of the studio. And with everything that started breaking in October, uh, with sexual harassment, uh, with the Me Too movement, and with really the abysmal behavior of so many men in Hollywood and across the nation, we had to find a way to at least give voice uh, to that experience and to the changing face of Hollywood. So thank you again for being a part of this. Welcome to Zach Barnett Studios. We're here if you have any questions. Hope it'll be a great evening. Stick around. See you later. Uh, I'm Zach Barnett. Welcome to Zach Barnett Studios. This is Martha Gaiman. Uh, <laughs> for those of you that don't know Martha, it seems like most of you do, but Martha is another one of the master acting teachers at the studio, um, as well as being an incredible actress, director, teacher, and my personal mentor. Um, so thank you so much for, for joining tonight. As John mentioned, uh, this is one of our C Talks. And uh, C, the acronym stands for Spirituality, Entertainment, and Activism. And our belief, one of our core beliefs here at the studio is that an artist is defined by the questions they ask themselves. Uh, and those three themes kind of encompass life's biggest questions for an actor. Um, and we really believe that while we don't have those answers for those people, the, the process of asking and the clarity you receive as a result really defines an actor's presence, purpose, character, and influence. So, uh, you know, we really wanted to be a part of that kind of actor training. Tonight we will discuss topics women are facing in the industry today in the hopes that we all, audience, and panelists alike become clearer on how we may have be of service to the world we live in within our art and our lives. I want to start the conversation with Danielle McDonald, whose breakout film Patty Cakes we all just watched, or most of us watched. Um, Danielle has been a student of mine since 2011. And you know, one of the joys, it's like being a parent, I guess. One of the joys of uh, being a teacher is when your students succeed, right? Um, and it's particularly, particularly rewarding uh, when those students have such a generosity of heart, commitment, incredible talent, and humility. Uh, brief story on Danielle's humility. Um, about six months ago, we were doing a showcase here at the studio, and Danielle wasn't even performing that night, and she called me, uh, and was like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, is it okay if I miss tonight? I got cast in a movie and I have to rehearse with Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> and I was like, no, get your ass in here. <laughs> no. I was like, no, yeah, go, go with Jen. And this is like the first time I've seen her since go with Jen. It's so. really exciting. So a little bit about Danielle. She's from Sydney, Australia. She moved to the States in 2010 and made her feature film debut in the East. Shortly after she appeared in the films Trust Me, Every Secret Thing, Jeremy Jasper's film Patty Cakes, which premiered at the 2017 Sundance Film Festival before going to South by Southwest, new directors, new films, and Cannes Film Festival earning rave reviews at all of them. We just screened Patty Cakes, some of you saw it. And it's absolutely marvelous. So we all know why this woman is not just a breakout talent, but a true rising star. So welcome back to ZBS, Danielle! Come this way. OK, cool. <laughs> this is you. OK, cool. Here you go. Thank you. So, so we have a couple questions for you before we get to everybody else. Um, so I was in the audience at Sundance when, when the film premiered, and um, it was a real moment for everyone in the audience, because it, it was clear that something significant had just happened, and that, I know this is going to make you so uncomfortable, but it was kind of like a, a Star is Born moment, right? And you're, you're like, no, it wasn't. Okay, but it was. And so 
So, you know, Danielle comes out on stage and there is just a, the most incredible standing ovation. I was actually, a friend of mine had been uh, at Sundance um, when, what was the, Little Miss Sunshine premiered and said it was this very similar feeling. Um, so I just imagine, I've wanted to ask you what it was like to be on the other side of that moment, to be on the stage with that response and did you feel like it was a life-changing moment? Um, <laughs> uh, th that's a hard one to answer. Um, cause yeah, it was crazy. It was, it was a crazy moment. And I think cause we were all really in it together, like the whole cast, um, we were all really overwhelmed that people were standing up and clapping for our little movie. So it was very overwhelming, but we were kind of all in it together. So we we're all just kind of looking at each other and it's like no one else almost existed in a weird way. Mm -hmm. So yes and no, because you kind of zone it out in a really strange way. Mm. Does that make sense? It's, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, but um, it was, it was definitely, like Sundance in general was just kind of magical. So after the film, the film, after Sundance, the film sold um, at Sundance, which was really, really cool. Um, and you got signed with CAA and you've been working like crazy. Um, will you tell us some of the projects you're working on? And I actually specifically want to know, because you've worked with some incredible actors this year, um, who has inspired you the most as an actor? Ever or this year? Let, let, <laughs> let's just do both. Oh, I mean, in working with them. Um, whew, a, lo a lot of people have. Um, I, I, I got to, I mean, I, I, I've worked on a couple movies this year. Um, I did a movie called Dumplin, um, which was a lot of fun, and we filmed that one in Atlanta. Uh, but it was really, it was really kind of a special thing, and it was very positive movie. Um, and it felt like we kind of all really brought each other up. And you never really know with like a group of girls that you've never met before. You don't know how it's gonna go. And we were all kind of just really surprised, like how much we actually liked each other and still hang out afterwards now, which is really cool. Um, but that was an incredible experience. And then I just finished a movie called Bird Box, which I filmed here in LA. And that one uh, is completely different. It's, it's a thriller, horror-ish movie. I, I think one of the people that has inspired me the most while working, uh, Frances McDormand, uh, produced a movie I did. Uh, years ago and she kind of gave me some really amazing advice just I'd I'd never done a lead before and this was right before my first lead role and I was definitely very nervous and she just kind of just spoke to me about her first time doing a film her experiences um, and that honestly was kind of amazing and helped me beyond belief so I've never forgotten kind of the words that she said to me. And so that was something that I've always carried with me. Yeah. How was working with John Malkovich? Uh, it was really good. I was really intimidated <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> he's really nice. Um, but it, he's just, he's John Malkovich. And so I was like, oh gosh, I don't want to be st stupid in front of you. I don't know. I was like, I don't know like how to react. And it was, it was interesting because we're all like stuck in a house together, kind of the whole movie-ish. So we're all working with each other very closely for a good period of time. I was working on it for maybe a month. And I came in like a week after everyone else into this house. So they'd all been working together for a week and I just have to kind of come into this house hysterical. And I was like, this is really intimidating. It was, it was terrifying. And uh, everyone was very welcoming and um, everyone was very supportive throughout that process. So that's that was my first day and I was like, okay, I think this is gonna be an okay project because everyone was really nice about it. Um, but he was uh, really cool. I don't know, I remember talking to him in the van and his wife is from like where my mom's from in this small town in Italy. So I was like, oh, okay. We got some, <laughs> we got some like familiar ground here. Yeah. Cool. Um, I, I remember you telling me, uh, <clears throat> or a big part of your story is that you came here having booked a series regular, um, and then when you got here for visa issues, you lost the role, right? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I came out here and I auditioned for a show, and I booked a series regular on it, and it had a 10-episode pickup, 
And then I was not able to do it because I didn't get my visa in time to do the project, um, which sucked. <laughs> but it also got me my visa. Like it, uh, that deal memo really helped me get my visa, and the network really helped me um, get references and everything. So. I wouldn't be here without that project. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, I think it did everything it, it was meant to do, and I'm really grateful for it for that reason. So there's a part two to that question, um, which is, uh, you know, for all the aspiring actors you know, in the audience here or uh, at home, um, was, because I was thinking maybe that was one of those moments that it was almost like, okay, this isn't gonna happen. But if that wasn't it, was there another? And if there was, what was it that got you through that moment? Um, well, that was my first ever audition, so if I'd given up that easy, that ah. would have been <laughs> kind of pathetic, I think. Um, so, no, that wasn't one of those ah. moments. I think if I hadn't gotten my visa, I think that would have been like a very depressing moment. Um, because I, I tried to work in Australia, I just never got any auditions there. So I figured, I was hoping at least if I had a chance to come out here and start from scratch, uh, I would at least get auditions here <laughs> and maybe have a chance. So that was exactly what I wanted and that's what I got from that opportunity. Um, I kind of worked, fail I, I got at least like a small job, like a co-star or something or two every year after I moved out here. And then there was a year where I, I got like four jobs and I was like, oh, this is exciting. I did the, pa I did the Sundance Labs uh, for patty cakes. And then after that year, I didn't work for a full year at all. Um, and I had more auditions than ever that year, and I didn't book any. <laughs> and I remember thinking, wow, am I getting worse? Like, I don't, I don't know. That kind of sucks. Um, and it, it didn't make me want to give up, but it was definitely a really hard moment where I was like, I don't know how to, like, progress further than where I'm at. Um, and I don't know how to make a living kind of doing this for the rest of my life, but I, I'm still gonna try. So will you tell us about, there's a story in, um, there's a scene, even though the movie Patty Cakes is about a self-assured, sort of, it's so funny. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if I would say that, but yeah. anyway, it's on here. So. Um, <laughs> I think I have to wing it. <laughs> um, so, but um, there, there, um, we want to have an honest discussion about a lot of topics, but including body image. And so, can you tell that story about when Patty's in a rap battle with the boys, and they keep calling, he keeps calling you Dumbo, and what happened in that scene? Because it's really an interesting story. Will you tell us that? Yeah. Um, I mean, that was kind of a funny scene to film because the the vibe on set is not what it is in the movie you know it's um the other actor who's calling me all these names like he's a total sweetheart and like wouldn't actually was really struggling to act opposite and say these things he, he wouldn't kind of go for it now director's like you have to do this and I was like just do it <laughs> and so like, had to coax I had to coax him cruel. into being cruel because wow. he was like this is I he, he couldn't do it and I was like do it don't worry I'm about to come right back at you with stuff. <laughs> 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 I'm about to emasculate you it's okay like <laughs> back and forth so we, we had like a nice dynamic because after every time after every take we would uh, just hug it like we wouldn't say anything because we wanted to kind of keeping our worlds there, but like we would just kind of have like, you know, one arm tug, like we're good, and kind of keep going. That was just our thing, that was how we dealt with it. Um, and then the end of the night, he was like, oh thank God, I can be like happy again. <laughs> but it was, uh, that was our first time I think rapping in front of people, because um, wow. he's not a rapper either. And so we'd done it with like a couple of people, and like obviously the entire crew had already seen me, but um, this was the first time with uh, background who, we didn't know who we didn't feel like oh they're really supportive of us because they're our crew so it was really intimidating for that reason that was really scary I, it's this, this funny thing where i feel like you have to let things affect you to be able to get in that moment but because it was such a 
safe situation. Mm -hmm. I I never felt personally victimized in the moment. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a a tricky one, but the character does, and so you you relate and you listen and you feel. Yeah. You know, I'm, this is a comment. Um, you can comment on it or not, but there's something interesting about you talking about not feeling victimized by it, but the character did. Um, but there was something in the character that, that also didn't. Like, I never thought of Patty as a victim. Mm. And I also not, and this is, you know, I never thought of her as a joke. And I feel like a lot of times, plus size actresses, that's how they end up getting treated. And the fact that you were so relatable and brought us so in, I, and I know, that, again, this is, you're one of these people that's like, it's all about the work, you did the best you could do, you brought yourself fully, but I think it's one of those roles that does have the power to transform culture. And I think it's so cool that Dumplin' has a lot of body image stuff in it as well, right? Yeah. We talk a little bit about that, can you? Yeah, uh, Dumplin' is a movie uh, about a beauty pageant, I guess, um, set in Texas. And it's, uh, my mom is kind of the, the what is, she like runs the pageant and she's an ex-beauty queen herself. Jennifer Aniston. Yeah, Jennifer Aniston, <laughs> yes, plays my mom. Um, <laughs> So she's, she's <coughs> that woman and I'm her daughter and we've never really connected and we've never really gotten along. We have very different views. I hate the pageant, it's her whole life. And uh, it's uh, kind of about my character deciding to join the beauty pageant as a statement kind of against her mom. Um, but then these other girls join her as well and it kind of becomes this pact of these kind of misfits at school all joining the pageant together and competing and then kind of meeting the other girls as well and, and realizing that there's a lot of common ground within everyone. And uh, it's, yeah, it's a really kind of beautiful coming of age story. Mm. Um, very body positive, very just image positive in general, like not judging other girls for how they look, whether that be whatever way, um, because my character judges other people just as much for the pretty pageant girls. And it's, it's about not judging people in general based on their interests or how they look. And I think it's got a really great message um, and it had a great group of people behind it that really believed the message and I think that that's really important to kind of make a film feel really genuine and real. Yeah. So pressure about body image is only one of the many topics we'll be discussing tonight with some truly wonderful women of Hollywood. So let's welcome our panelists and keep this talk going. So let's welcome Marcy Leroff. Just... Justina Machado. <laughs> Victoria Morales. <laughs> Machen Amick. <laughs> Leslie Ann Warren. <laughs> Joelle Carter. Sandy McCree. All right. So, uh, so as you all walked in, uh, it's it was written by uh, one of our guest instructors here, um, and the opening of the lyrics uh, goes: "Looks so easy for the boys to make noise." while the girls sit screaming in their seats, silently scared to eat. According to Women in Hollywood founder, editor Melissa Silverstein, women's bodies have become a cultural war zone. So I guess tonight we are all here to step into, step into a bit of a war zone, see if we can wage a little battle for ourselves. So standards of beauty are evolving every day and with ambition and advocates, the way that women are expected to appear in the media and in real life can be changed to reflect the diversity of women that exists in the population. We welcome these incredible and dynamic women to take on such topics as 
body image, hashtag Me Too movement, gender divide, diversity, leadership behind and in front of the camera, pay equality, and ageism. We opened the conversation with Danielle discussing a tiny bit about body image. And Joelle and Victoria, you also wanted to mention something on the topic of body image. Joelle, something to say? Uh, it hits home with me um, because I have a daughter. And so right away I'm like, what I've already had to suffer through um, and where we're put as women in um, the industry, I don't want her to have to face. Um, I loved this movie we got to see because it um, just uh, hits home that uh, you need to go into the room as an actor or any field that you're in and be totally who you are because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for, um, they need us. They need us as ourselves in the room and we need to, we need to help as an industry to make more parts available for each and every size, shape, um, color, and um, I'm just honored to be here. I think as far as <clears throat> body image goes, I, I've had a personal experience with that since I started professionally acting, and I think what we need to focus on changing is the, the standard that society expects us to be and whether I mean it was from like either being smaller or being bigger for a role and I experienced that recently and and I think I spoke up and said well it's not necessary for the role it's not necessary for the character to be that specific way but I think it's also a lot of the pressure that we put on ourselves but I think that's from society's pressure of what they have seen and that's where mine came in is like the pressure on myself and um I think it's just it's about changing that perspective and about creating um what is real what uh, we see around us rather than what we've seen for the past um I don't know since the film industry has been going <laughs> uh I think um, yeah, as far as women being perfect and being um, just an unrealistic idea. I have a five-year-old niece, and I think about her watching television and watching films, you know, and then her going out in the world and being like, well, this isn't what I learned, this isn't what I've seen, and this isn't what I lived through, you know, seeing the stories I've been seeing um so I think it's a really big it's a really big thing for a, a lot of women actresses and and men to uh to speak up and, and stand strong to just be the best you that you can be and be healthy and with mind and soul yeah um so we had some great questions on body image and diversity from the backstage community that is ideal for our casting director Marcy Liroff so, uh, one of the questions was, um, where are the acting opportunities for young adults who are not stick thin or morbidly obese, but normal weight or slightly overweight? <laughs> <laughs> not my question. It's all my fault. It's all my fault. <laughs> no, I think it's an actual question. It's not a rhetorical question. Okay, so well, what I have seen in, in I've been casting for about 38 years, quite honestly. And so I've seen several trends come and go uh, in terms of the films that we're watching and the people that are in them and the way that we're casting them. And one thing I can say for myself and for most of my colleagues as casting directors is that we have been trying to blow open that door for decades in terms of creativity and, and reading what's on the page and going, okay, that's interesting, I'll bring you those people, but then what about these people? And as casting directors, we've been doing that, like I said, for decades and, and certainly as long as I've been doing that, but just now people are starting to listen, meaning the filmmakers, the showrunners, the networks, the studios are starting to listen because it's so much more interesting to watch people that represent what the world looks like out there. And now with, with uh, 
television and, and cable television, the writing has changed, and that's what I've seen that has changed a lot in the last several, several years. It, I think it all stems from the writing in terms of writing these great parts for women and uh, for different kinds of casting. And they're starting to listen to some of the brilliant ideas that we've been coming up with for years. But instead of casting this the way it's written, about opening that up and casting someone who uses a wheelchair for this role when it's not written for someone that uses a wheelchair or, you, or, or hiring a trans actor. I mean, that's what we've been trying to do for years that now people are very, very open to. In fact, they're insisting upon mm -hmm. the uh, inclusivity of, of diversity. And uh, like I said, we've been doing this for a long time, but, but now I think we have their ear to show them how it, much more interesting it actually is. So where are those roles? They're coming. They're out there. You know, many times it's, if you're just starting out, it's in your theater. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it's in your theater at school. And casting a man for a woman's part or a woman, f no, not, casting a woman for a man's part. <laughs> and, uh, and, and just being creative and being open. And I think people are, are much more open to that creativity now because they know they have to. Because I think as women, we're all done. Right, we're done with <laughs> not getting these uh, great parts because they're written for this, you know, cute little thin little girl, and it just gets boring after a while. Those prototypes, those stereotypes, the writers aren't writing that way as much anymore. So I'm seeing a great trend. So um, then we're on to this other issue, which is ageism, and, and this industry eats women up in their 20s and spits them out in their 30s. Another Another thing that I have experienced, um, <laughs> Leslie Ann, your career has been a literal Cinderella story that spans nearly five decades. Can you share your thoughts on ageism in Hollywood? Uh, well, um, I think be because I've been working my entire life, my entire life, um, I started when I was 17 on Broadway in my first show. Um, and I was 18 when I did Cinderella, and um, you know, I I haven't actually experienced that shelf life issue. I haven't, but I think it was largely due to my willingness um, to embrace whatever age I was being perceived as, whatever that was, you know, in somebody else's mind, but and to continue to allow myself to grow into whatever next stage and whatever next phase I was, I was living and being hired for. And, you know, I remember I started really thinking about this intensely when I was in my late 40s I, I, because I wanted to continue to act and I wanted to... Um, I wanted to create women. Um, a lot of my 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 um, the people I look up to are French women, women in French films, and that's because in in Europe um, you're allowed to be a woman aging and still be a complicated, interesting adult, intelligent, sexy, if you will, <laughs> you know, woman who has a life. Not so much here. It's it was it's changing. It's changing radically, and um, you know I, I just saw a performance by Annette Bening in her latest film that is so stunning. And and I got to I know her and I got to talk to her afterwards. And I, I my eyes were filled with tears because this is a this is a person who is happens to be a woman who is who is marching to a different drum and who is willing to embrace her aging and willing to be completely. Um, uh, comfortable and owning her, her her aging and her the incredibly graceful way that she's doing it and the brilliant acting that she's doing with it. So you know, I think it's really changing. I think women today are not women actresses, whatever, are not willing to um, you know give up or give in to that shelf life idea. They're saying, no, no, no. You know, I'm here. I'm great. I'm doing, you know, interesting work. I am interesting. And, um, 
because so many more of them are doing it, it's changing the face mm -hmm. of or the idea of what that, you know, that that aging idea has been here. In uh, that's my experience anyway. Um, and I remember when I first decided to, okay, you know, now I'm going to be a mother on film. Okay, now I'm going to be a grandmother on film. Okay, you know, I'm a living woman who is aging. You know, why would I run from, you know, I have a, a son who chose not to have children, but I mean, I could be a grandmother, absolutely. You know, why would I run from that on film? And if I'm not willing to do it, and so many other women, fabulous women actresses are doing it, um, we are, you know, we're changing that perception, and I think it's, you know, very powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say something though? To I agree with what you're saying in that I, I think as a woman and as an actor, embracing and not fighting the naturalness of of aging is very important. But I'm still being as a casting director and a producer, I'm still being faced with the writing of these 60, 70 year old men that they want to, me to cast the 30 year old wife. So as much as, as an actor, you have to accept who you are and, and not be afraid of playing those roles, but this double standard that we keep talking about still exists that uh, some of the creators, or the creative people that I'm, I'm dealing with still see this as a normal couple. But the interesting and fabulous role is the ex-wife that's left. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. So. I actually, silver lining, good job. Yeah. <laughs> I actually just had a really interesting experience on a film because uh, I read the script and I knew that they were interested in me for a role. And first of all, the, the lead role was written as a 30-year-old. And I know that they'd cast a 50-year-old for the role. And I loved that. Um, and she's an amazing female actress. And then for her love, for her love interest, they cast a 27-year-old guy. And I loved that. And then for my role, I remember reading it, and it said, um, I can't remember exactly how it was written, but it was a petite, little, like, breakable kind of <laughs> girl. And I was like, OK, cool, probably not going to get this. And they told me some of the actors I was up against for the role, and I was like, I'm definitely not going to get this. And they also wanted a social media following and all this thing. And I was like, it's not going to happen. And then we had an incredible female director who was like, I don't care about that, and I'm doing what I want, and I'm casting who I want, and she did. And we need more people like that right. who want their creative vision mm -hmm. on screen told, and that was a really incredible experience for me for that reason. May Chen, I want to yeah. ask you. Um, um, so while some have, actresses have resorted to hiding their age for fear of losing parts, May Chen Amick has made has had a unique experience of playing the same role within a 20-year span of her actual life. She portrayed the beautiful sex symbol temptress Shelley Johnson in David Lynch's groundbreaking series Twin Peaks in 1990 and returned to play the beautiful sex symbol temptress mother Shelley Johnson in the 2017 reboot, reboot of the cult TV show, Machen. Can you share with us the experience of playing a character in real time age and how you feel being a sex symbol in your 20s, 30s, and 40s? Oh, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Who do I pay? <laughs> um, I, I listened to everybody's point so far, and I think it's all really amazing to bring up Everything that you guys are talking about, about, about being um, unapologetic and, and brave and powerful and owning who you are, and we have to keep doing that, absolutely, but we also really have to tackle who hires us. And the only way to really change who hires us is to get diversity into the field of who hires us. So we can be brave. <laughs> And we can embrace how old we are, how diverse we are, but you're still gonna have that asshole behind the desk at the studio that wants the girl, can I swear? Yeah. That he, that he can fuck, mm -hmm. that's fuckable. 
And um, until we get more women in there and we get more diversity in there with different ethnicities, we're, we gotta change it faster. So still be brave, still fight, but we gotta get more diversity in there. <laughs> so with all that said, you know, talking about body image, I came from Reno to LA at 16 and started auditioning. I continued to study, but I started auditioning. And one of the first kind of major things I was offered was a big feature um, with Bob Hoskins, Denzel Washington. And I was going for a part that was a prominent supporting character. And I went through all the rounds of auditioning and you, oh, you're great and you're so perfect. And then the question came, will you get a boob job? And I was like, why? <laughs> well, because your character wears a bathing suit top during the whole film, and we'd really like you to have bigger breasts. <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> and they said, no, no, don't worry about it. We'll pay for it. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I think that this role isn't for me, and I declined it. Then when we go into sort of the Me Too movement and the continuing predatory ways of the people that we work for, and I've, I've been in the business, thankfully, 30 years. And I can sit here and share so many stories with you. And I've been very hesitant to share them quite yet with the movement, only because the people that I would talk about really have already been dealt with. Anything from getting the role and having the director walk me to my hotel room, let me, oh, no, let's have a nightcap. No, dude, no, it's not going to happen. And then... He doesn't speak to me for the rest of filming. <laughs> okay, fine. I'm still going to kill it on film. You, you know, you deal with your issues, and I'm still going. I'm not going to be, um, you know, fearful now because now all of a sudden I've rejected you. Um, going and rehearsing and being cast in a part with a, with William Hurt, um, and then being taken out to dinner by the director and and basically saying, so I'm going to need to film you completely nude when you do your strip scenes. And I was like, well, but this is movie of the week, so it's, you don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, I need them for my personal archive. Oh. And I said, interesting. I said, thank you, check. And I went back to my hotel room and I called my agent, my manager, and I said, I wanna be on the next flight home. And he said, well, don't you wanna, you know, negotiate and talk? And I said, no, I'm done. I don't wanna work with this person. So I flew home. So have I turned down a lot of roles because this happened? Yes. Do, have I regretted it? No. Because in doing that, um, I set a standard for myself. And what that also did is I didn't embrace being a trophy to anyone else. Mm -hmm. And my biggest thing to anyone who's coming into the business, and any female especially who's coming into the business, Y y if you stand up for yourself, yeah, you're going to miss out on some stuff. But I can, I can tell you standing here 30 years later and having the successes that I have, I went for longevity and I went for integrity. And I'm still fucking here. And I'm still having success. <laughs> and I didn't compromise. <laughs> and, I, and I think in doing so, I also allowed myself to age on film. You know, I didn't stick to some trophy, some decoration on some guy's arm. So I think I, it was just like, hey, this is me, and this is going to be me for years to come. So I don't know if I answered the question, but <laughs> I just went on a, a, a You a did. Rant. OK. You great. did. You okay. answered it. <laughs> and because we have cable and indies with um, more opportunities for older actresses, um, we really are just waiting for the commercial world to get on board. But Leslie, what would you say to your younger self? Uh, but this doesn't really have anything to do with this topic necessarily, but I was so filled with fear. I had so much fear. I mean, honestly, I don't know how I, how I managed to have a career because I was so afraid. I was so afraid. And yet, um, something greater than that fear, um, you know, carried me through and allowed me to, to keep 
going. And I had a, you know, I was very, very, very lucky. I had a, a tremendous amount of success at a very young age. And, um, you know, a lot of it I didn't get to enjoy. So I think because I was so filled with fear and I was so filled with um, just so much self-doubt. Um, so I would tell my younger self, you know, and any of you who are beginning or, you know, on your way, to, to try and find a way to deal with that fear separately from, you know, it's a separate, it's a separate thing. It's not who you are. It's, um, it's something that, that um, you know, that kept me from enjoying a lot of what I was getting to do, and I, you know, I have no regrets about that. It was, you know, it was, uh, I, I really don't, but I, but if I were able to tell my younger self something, I would just um, want her to, to be able to experience, you know, the joy of what she was getting to do, not just the, oh my God, will they like me, will they like me, you know, all of that stuff, so that's it. That's great. How about you? How about you, Joelle? What would you say to your younger self? Any thoughts? Don't come to Hollywood. No. <laughs> Be a scientist. Um, uh, uh, Fear is a big thing. I totally agree. When you said that, it hit home. Um, and uh, don't overthink everything too much. Really, yeah. Try to try to find the joy in the process because the process is what it's all all about. Yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah. It's true. It is about the process. So now um, I want to talk about diversity. That's one of our next subjects. And the Oscars were so white in 2015. And both viewers and film industry insiders zero in on the lack of roles for people of color in front and behind the camera. Let's open this up to the panelists. Um, do you feel that they are doing enough? No. Anybody? No. Okay. Well, I just no. really have something to say about this because I'm a member of the Academy, and I want to say that it is not. I was so angry when all of this happened, because this is not the Academy's fault. These are the filmmakers' faults. Whoever is making the films, whatever studios are greenlighting the films, whatever you know, the writers that are writing the films, the, the Academy simply votes on what's in front of them. These films were already made, so just like um, was Marcy, was it you? I can't, or no, somebody, I can't remember who said it, but somebody said, you know, we have to hold the people responsible who are making these films. These are the people that have to b get diversity in their brains and start to write accordingly. And, you know, so, and I do want to just say, because I'm, I, it made me crazy. The, the, the day that, or the time that the Oscar So White thing sort of caught on virally and all that, you know, it, it was someone who has nothing to do with the business, who hadn't, it emanated from somebody who had nothing to do with our business. And that was the, that was after, that came right after the year that 12 Years a Slave won. So it was kind of crazy. I'm sorry, I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> Next. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I don't think they're doing enough. I don't think any of them, not the Emmys, not SAG, not Golden Globes, not any of them. Diversity is not just black and white. Yes. Okay, yeah. first of all, they got to stop that already. It's not just like, oh, look, we nominated some African Americans, now we have diversity. No, yeah. diversity is all this room. It's like Latinos, Asian, transgender, you know, all of it. And so, no, they're not doing enough. And I don't know whose fault it is, but it's got to change. And yeah. we have to stop thinking like, okay, it's okay. All right, that's okay. They nominate this person, this, this one. <laughs> no, it's not okay. It's not. And so this is something that has to change. Sandy. Sandy. Talking about blame. I don't know about yeah. blame. Um, but I think it, it starts with the people in our homes. Because growing up very young, um, and you said so beautifully, um, about standards of beauty. And when I turned on the TV set, it, I didn't see me. But then we, they did a black show. Oh, we got good times for you, you know. So I could watch that a little. But still, the, we weren't represented. And many of us are not often represented. 
Um, we have prominent people that are in position. We have a lot of writers that are coming out. But then it's a black show, or it's fresh off the boat, or this show. It's not. It's not inclusive, but again, it starts at home. I mean, how many of you have seen Mudbound yet? Okay, not not even a fourth of the room. It's really good. It's the director's amazing. Um, there are a lot of uh, movies that have come out. Girls Trip had Girls Trip had a huge publicity campaign, so everybody was on that boat. But there's so many independent films, so many wonderful, well-written shows over the years that we don't see because if we can't identify with it, we may not have any interest in, in watching it. It may not be my cup of tea. It starts in the home of, of picking up a book. It could be a book um, on Armenian culture or African American culture or Asia, any type of culture. But until we become inclusive with ourselves, with our families and bring them up, these young writers that are gonna come up, the young directors, yeah. the young producers, it's not gonna happen. And they in the Academy, I know we're saying that we're not blaming the Academy. I'm a part of the television academy. It's a lot. They we get a lot of, of films to watch. I don't know how many people watch and voted for my film. How many of you turned on BET and watched the new edition story? Four, five. <laughs> a lot of people watched The Wire because again, the, uh, the boat was rolling and it's the best show on TV, you gotta watch it. But again- That was also a different time though because there's so much content now, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So, so, but so, so then what do we do? do? Do we need the studios to back it a little bit more? Do you know what I mean? The, the shows, put them out there a little bit more, do stuff like that? Because now there's a million shows. It's not like back in the day when I was on Six Feet Under, you were on The Wire. Yeah. That was just HBO, <laughs> right? That was like almost 15 years ago, 17 years ago. So there's a lot. I think there's, some, there's something to, mm -hmm. I, there's a kernel of something that what you're saying that it comes from the home. And what one of you said here uh, about seeing yourself, like I'm not seeing myself on, on, on a, in a show growing up. And so wh how does it hatch that writer? And, and so, uh, but somebody else talked about um, preempting themselves or, or saying that, you know, they're not going to go ahead with something because they don't think I don't fit in mm -hmm. and I'm not the kind that they want. Uh, on television or in a film, and so you kind of your your career goes off in another direction because you think I don't see myself in any of these characters, but if these young writers get a spark of something and then grow up to be adult writers, and like you said, we've got to get them in the room. The, you know, the 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 writing staffs have got to be diverse, and more and more they're starting to get that way. But it just it takes time, unfortunately, but I've seen a lot of change in the last 10 or 15 years. Yeah. It's not yeah. fast enough, and I agree with you. It's not fast enough at all, but that's, you know, that's part of my job as a casting director and a producer, and, and to, to make the world on screen look like what the world is out there for real. And well, Viola Davis said something in 2015, and when she was at the Oscars and she said, there is the talent out there, but there's not the work and opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what we need to create is the opportunities. Sorry, go, and go ahead. going right off of that, I mean, I'm a multi-ethnic woman and I've never seen anybody like me on TV except for like Raven Simone or like now Blackish is a thing and I was very honored to be on that show. But I think the most important thing to remember is as people of color and as minorities and as diverse people, yes, it is our job to keep the line moving forward. Therefore, whoever's fault it is, it might be on both sides, is to, again, just reiterating, keep making the content so we can no longer be looked past, so we have those equal opportunities. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, one of the things, um, I'm on the board of the Casting, so Casting Society of America, which is a group of casting directors, international group of casting directors, and one of the things that we've been concentrating on lately is doing open calls for diverse communities. So we had an international open call for uh, transgender actors 
and it was probably about 16 countries around the globe all on the same day, on the same weekend, so that we could all get to know these actors. But because you were talking about there's no, uh, what Viola Davis said, that, there, that there's good actors, but there's no opportunity. opportunity. There's also, so there's no opportunity for them to actually build their resume. And I'm, if I'm working on something, um, I'll say, what about an interesting, a uh, person who uses a wheelchair or someone who's blind, they're like, yeah, show me, so show me someone who's really good. Well, I'm gonna have to go hunt for that person and I will find them as, as we normally do. But these open calls that we're doing, uh, we're doing one on Sunday for um, handy capable actors. And this is, again, across the United States. So that we'll have this amazing database of actors. I can go into work the next day and say to the showrunner, I met 10 amazing people that we need to have on the show. And we need to educate them. Justina, I'm, I'm interested in uh, hearing you talk about your experience on One Day at a Time and what it's like to to have one of those opportunities and what the, res what the sense of responsibility is or how that may, wa may weigh differently because there are such few opportunities for representation. It's, uh, I always say this is like, a, the show's a dream come true. It's literally like the perfect acting cocktail. And because I'm able to do everything that I can do. Because so many times as, and not just a person, uh, like a Latina woman, just a woman in general, we're put in boxes, you know what I mean? Of like, what we're supposed to act like. This is what we're supposed to be. I can only speak from my experience, and there's like four boxes for Latinas. It's like the suffering mother, it's like the over-sexualized woman, the asexual cop, or, you know, and, and some other stuff. I, I, I'm sure I played them all. But, except for the over-sexualized woman. <laughs> um, but uh, because the person on the other side didn't see it that way. But it's, uh, I love One Day at a Time. First of all, our showrunner is a woman and a man, right? Then we have Norman Lear. And I already knew Norman Lear. Our, I already knew when I was walking into that audition that this man was about the acting. Do you know what I mean? I didn't have to worry about me going in there and killing it and then them saying they're going a different way for, you know, obvious reasons because I'm a normal sized person. But um, uh, it's the, uh, do I feel a sense of responsibility? Absolutely, and I love it, because we're changing the Latino narrative. So people are looking at this and they're saying, oh, my family's like that, and they happen to be Caucasian, Jewish, Italian, not Catholic, Methodist, it, African American, it doesn't matter. It's a universal story. It's about family, it's about love, and it's also bringing back the middle class hero, which I think is really interesting because we've gone so far to like, you know, the, the doctors and the lawyers and all that. And so it's, it's kind of doing a great thing for um, my people. <laughs> I love the show. I think it's a great show, you know? But then again, how many of you have seen the show? Oh, okay, but you see, because there's so much content. I'm like, uh, so that's why social media helps, but I'm not very good at that. <laughs> but it's been great. It's been great. I, I, I appreciate it every day, and I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Uh, we're discussing these topics, and this discussion increases the climate of openness and can help push the issues and initiatives forward by sparking change. So coming from two different generations and this being an intergenerational conversation, Sandy and Gabrielle, what are you each doing to inspire others, younger and older, to champion uh, for women of color? For me, I have to keep growing as a professional actor, as a yeah. person, so um, I've been fortunate to be surrounded with so many um, incredible women and men in the industry to mentor me and to say this is the steps that I took or you should do this. I have um, two friends that are supporting me tonight, um, Naomi Grossman uh, from American Horror Story and Lois Hunter who is the chairman of the theater department at LOXA. Um, I constantly look at other women who have been courageous in this industry and so I'm able to give back and when I have um, young people, um, I work mostly with teenagers, and they look like all of you. Um, it's important for me to let them know that they have it, that everything is already there. You talk about that fear. Yeah. 
Um, I have to find that fear, um, find their weaknesses, find their, um, their individualities, their commonalities, and find their voices to become strong, whether they want to pursue acting, writing, directing, but as individuals to know that you, you, you guys are all incredible that we can't feel like, wow, she just did this monologue and she was really good and you're over here thinking like we do when we go into auditions. Mm -mm. No, yeah. we're all able to be grounded and to bring it mm -hmm. and to have our voices, but it's just, a, it's, it's the, the finding of the voices and how do we find them? We, I gotta know who you are and who you are and what our ethnicities are. I can't assume, I can't assume to know who your father is or who your mother is, but before we leave my class, we will know because we, we miss out on our individual histories and yeah. stuff, then that's what makes us these great actors and these great people that become vulnerable in this sense, that it's not just white and black yeah. and red and right. yellow. And going exactly off of that, like what I'm trying to do and what Zach has given me the greatest opportunity to do is to give back to the community of where I started. Um, and uh, just so many things. Just going off of what Sandy said is like, it just encomp it encompasses being your true authentic self. And I have learned that a beautiful way, but also a hard way. I'm four different races. Um, and I was never really accepted or could find or identify with one race, but it gave me the beautiful gift of knowing I don't have to. I can speak on the Black Lives Matter movement because I have a black father. I can represent specific Islander because my mom is Filipino and I'm also part white. Um, so it's, been, it's given me a beautiful opportunity to understand and empathize with all of my ethnicities and know that I can find inner unity, inner respect, and inner peace and bring that to my work. I mean, Will Smith says a great thing of like, what are you doing? Um, to elevate people, are you making them laugh? Are you making them think? And personally and professionally, that is my goal, is to elevate the conversation. Um, so it's just really owning who you are and everything that makes you who you are um, is what I continue to do, what I uh, strive for every day. And it's not an easy road, but I have to say it's the most rewarding. I mean, when I speak out on political things or like terrible things that happen in our country, I get messages from mixed race girls and biracial girls saying thank you to me. Mm. And like, I'm so proud to be a product of Love Transcending Boundaries for generations. Um, that, repeat that again. I like that statement. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> I mean, if you want me to, I, gotta I wink. worked I gotta really wink. hard. I like, I like that. finding my words. Um, Love Gabby, I'm that got me a wink from my man. Yeah. <laughs> Love, what are you repeat that again? It's love transcending boundaries, and I say that because my, my grandfather on my mother's side is Scottish and Filipino, and then my dad is Japanese and black. So, and they were in the Air Force, you guys. So it's like, it's even harder. And to, to come from that, your mom, to come from that, it's like, I, again, like it's been a curse, but it's also been a greatest blessing for me, so. Thank you. So for a long time, our next subject is the hashtag Me Too. And for a long time, most women define their own sexual harassment and assault in this way. Unspoken, private, ashamed of acknowledging it. Silence, although understandable, has its cost. The hashtag Me Too spread virally on social media in October 2017 to denounce sexual assault and harassment in the wake of allegations against Harvey Weinstein, film producer. And it wasn't just women, many men spoke up about their experiences with assault. We have a few great questions from the backstage and ZBS community, and I wanted to open them up to all of you or anybody who wants to comment. And the first question is, what different types of harassment have you seen? And what warning signs can women look out for as their careers progress? Meetings in hotel rooms, excessive interest in a woman's career, being too touchy-feely. Does anyone want to weigh in on this subject? I remember um, I started my career in New York and it wasn't odd to be asked to go to a hotel um, because a lot of uh, directors and producers would fly in 
and and they wouldn't go to a casting studio. They would set up at a hotel. But most of the time, it was multiple people at the casting and the producers and the directors. Um, I feel like we shouldn't subjugate people to that experience. Like it should never be in that in that situation. Selma Blair wrote an article about Jim Toback. <sighs> And he's and I've had I've had my I call it my time with Toback. Um, I wrote my own article. I didn't send it out anywhere, but I wrote it f for my daughter again because I wasn't violated in a way that I was penetrated or I didn't let him touch me in any way. But this man tried to pick me up multiple times and didn't even remember that he had tried to pick me up. <laughs> the movie, the um, pickup artist, is about this man's true story in New York. I mean, there are so many women that he has approached and violated verbally um, his, his ideas of uh, how the world's created. And uh, I was, I ended up, uh, after three attempts of him not remembering that he had approached me in the same way, then um, finally having four more attempts and then working for him. And I'm ashamed that I worked for him, but, uh, you know, this, the job was good. It was under the circumstances of a casting director. It was, uh, when I got to the set, the woman I had the scene with said, I'll be directing us today. And I said, why? And she said, because he doesn't think um, you respect him and will be as comfortable with him around. And I'm like, well, you know, I got, I got away with it because I didn't have to really work with the man. but. How do, how do we prevent this happening for, I don't want my daughter to even be put in that situation. When, as I hear everybody coming out and talking about their experiences and talking about Me Too, I think that's a very important part of the process of now getting it out there and, and everybody hearing it and be, people being held accountable. But my biggest thing and my worry has been, okay, but now what? What is the change that's gonna follow it? You know, and so I think I just, sort of challenge everyone here in this room, whether we're sitting up here or you guys listening, for everyone to be an advocate for whatever you believe in. And if I would have told myself a long time ago, have the courage to become a filmmaker sooner, I would have. I now am stepping into that now, directing, and I have something in development at Showtime. I think every single one of us up here would create a project where we would Number one, not disrespect anyone. We would be inclusive. We would be diverse. So every single person in this room, do something active to create something. Don't just sit back and be hired. Let's make the change, whatever that means. So. And, and do something active to make a change in your own in your own personal life, not only in your in your creative art. Because we say like we want diversity, and we want to see shows that wouldn't be normally turned on in our in our households. Um, but even monetarily, we're divided um, by where we live mm -hmm. and what schools that our kids can go to. And how do we bring this into our communities and everyday life so that we can bring it into our our artistic world. Yeah, I, I I do think that things are radically changing. I mean, in my lifetime in this career, it would be unheard of to uh, confront a powerful man, and now they're coming down. I mean, they're they're hitting the floor, you know, with a. <laughs> I mean, it's like okay, bye. There goes another one. I mean, <laughs> and in all fields. I mean, not. I, I mean, in all. You know, obviously everybody here knows in business, <coughs> political, you know, across the board. But in in our field, in our world, it was just, you just didn't say a word. You, and I trust me, I've had, you know, my own Me Too experiences. And, um, you know, it was just, you just couldn't. Now there is such a sisterhood of voices <coughs> that are loud and m truly men are, are, are losing their life's careers, you know? Um, and so I think that the change is happening. And I, I, I don't think, you know, I hope, but I don't think that, that so many 
powerful men will, will, will be so quick <coughs> to uh, behave badly because the, this has happened and we have, you know, women have now spoken out. I don't know how many people here have, have heard about this, um, this organization called Time's Up now. Yes. Do, you, do you all know? Okay, so it's incredible. I mean, that's incredible. <coughs> You know they're they're going to put into you know they're going to there's going to be legislation, you know, it's great, it's great. I do have a I do have a question though. I mean, being different on this panel, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I it just it needs to be called attention to itself, and 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 I I feel like what I I was like my job my job my job is to listen. My job is to sort of continually um, learn to unsee the things that I have been given in my entitlement um, of just of being a man. Um, and this question of what is, what is it to be an ally? What is it, what would you like men, how would you like for men to be allies? What can we do to support? What this? you did tonight yeah. is a good, a really good step. Yeah. It's any kind of It's difficult, I mean, it's a really good question. What should men be doing at this point to help women and to help other men that are in this situation as, as well? Uh, it's just speaking up and speaking out. I mean, we, like, we've all had these experiences. Uh, I have so many that I could share, and I'm just wondering which one to share, quite honestly. Uh, I, I just think it comes down to who you are and, and who you're raised, whether you're, you're willing to put yourself out there and protect someone. Uh, if it's happening to someone that's maybe on your set or, or you know, something that you're, that you're seeing. Um, and speaking up and not letting this happen if you know it. The greatest thing that's happening now, I I'm, I'm, I'm feel horrible for all the people that, that is ha this has happened to, but they're all finding their voices and speaking together to be really loud to get something done. And that is such a huge change that I think we've never, it, it's, it's the tipping point. And that's where the change is coming from. We're organizing and we're just not gonna take it anymore, time's up. But I think as, as men, you've, there's this kind of boys club mentality that doesn't really work in 2017 anymore because there are going to be uh, re, uh, legal repercussions on the job. And, and it's also choosing for like the men in the business, um, a friend of mine, Channing Tatum, came out and immediately said that he wasn't going to do a film because of who was associated with it. And I think it's mm -hmm. choosing to not work with the people who are notorious. Mm -hmm. Being careful of accusations that may not be correct, but but as a supporter, say, you know what, you you have this reputation and I don't I'm not going to spend my you. money here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's stepping away. You know, I uh, over the Christmas holiday, um, my cousin-in-law uh, is a is a women's studies major, um, and she had a lot to say. Um, <laughs> and and <laughs> and uh, and what she said, I thought was so interesting. She was she said um, that culturally, women have held. Um, the, the quality of, of support. Mm -hmm. And until men start to do that, mm -hmm. and it, it's so interesting because I'm, I'm sitting on this panel and I'm, you know, I was thinking, am I gonna be uncomfortable? And I'm like, I'm so comfortable. <laughs> I'm so comfortable with women. Well, there's probably a reason I'm comfortable with women because women have been societally told to be comforting in some way, mm -hmm. but men have not. So, because I can imagine if there was a woman up here and everyone else is a man, they might not feel comfortable, mm -hmm. right? So, if I, if I can keep in my mind that my, part of my job is to create safety for other people, yeah. maybe that's the starting point. Yes. Um, so, the, this is going to be the last thing, and it's a big thing, but it's going to allow everyone to say what, what they, anything that they haven't been able to say yet. Um, so activism, uh, as an actor, uh, I believe is, uh, is, is really rooted in empathy, right? Like, we empathize with these characters. We bring humanity to them. 
And then the audience gets to experience their own life through us. They get to process, they get to feel their feelings through us and they get to heal on some level. And so there's a, there is a trust that is formed between the audience and the actor where they feel like they know you, right? And trust you. Like Viola Davis, I, she could do anything. I, I would trust her to take me anywhere. <laughs> um, but with that comes this responsibility of influence, right? How do we use that influence both in terms of being, you know, I in, our, in our daily lives, in the projects we choose, and in the organizations that we choose to support. So all of you have been given a platform and have been given an opportunity to influence and have activism through, through your work and your life. And how, at this point, do you choose to use it? Is my question. And maybe we can just get, as the last thing, we can just get an answer from, from everyone. Um, well, again, um, I've been fortunate because my everyday world looks like this audience. It's um, multicultural, generational, um, um, economically different. I volunteer a lot. Um, I go into hospitals. Um, I work in a public school. I'm now at this amazing studio, and um, I'm able to... Um, as I say, each one, teach one, I'm able to reach back. Um, and I, I think that's where my activism is. And it is through love. It's, I, I, people walk around and say, well, Sandy, why do you have a smile on your face when you're going through hell? And I was like, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> like I auditioned, so, you know, I'm sitting up here with some amazing, I've watched, I watch uh, so many things that all these women have been in, and it, it just, I mean, I'm honored. And, but again, no fear in that confidence, what, what I've been blessed with, that I can give back to these beautiful um, young ones. So that's my, act, my activism starts with love, the power of love, yeah. Are we going down the line? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I have to say my activism definitely started here with Zach. I'm blessed to be a teacher mentor, and I, I wish I had somebody um, who was able to give not only a young person's perspective, but a young actor's perspective, too. Um, I love coming in here every Monday and being able to um, encourage these kiddos to truly become their authentic selves and to do the work not only in their career, but also on themselves. Because um, I always say, if you don't... Like, I am the only instrument that I have, and if you don't know the intimate ins and outs of your instrument, you can't make great music. Um, and I, I am more activism than I do is, again, like, I, I speak out when I can, um, and it's always educatedly, not ignorantly. I think it's very important, especially for a young person. Um, I also just joined Women in Film and um, United, As United Nations Association as well. Um, and again, finding the bravery and the courage in myself to become my authentic self. Um, and it starts with you, always. Uh, yeah. Um, I think starting at home with um, uh, yourself and uh, with my child and uh, just teaching her how to open her eyes and see the world and the way that I was raised to see it, um, to um, have love for everyone and respect for everyone and that people are different and this is what we need to embrace. Um, I had a handicapped mother and uh, I remember the first time my daughter saw um, a handicapped person, she was just, it was an older woman and she just, she didn't know what to do with herself and she's so curious and the one thing we wanted for my mom and for us living with a handicapped person was for people to be curious. You got to start there and you have to be open to like explore that and um, and so I, I, I start there and I, I recycle a lot. I really am. <laughs> 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 um, Oh, uh, oh my, how do I give back? 
Oh, my whole life is about giving back. And that was a long road to giving back. Because <laughs> it was all about me for a long time. Um, teaching is one of my activism things. And I am raising a son. And he's entirely colorblind. And that's because of the way I educated him on purpose. And really, Zach giving me this opportunity to teach here has expanded my life in so many. And I mean, I've been teaching for 22 years because I thought, my God, I have all this knowledge. What am I going to do? And I, and I started just teaching in a room. And um, it ballooned. And believe me, I'm not really a business person. So it was word of mouth because I was passionate. And so I think that being able to see people bloom before your very eyes because of providing the opportunity for them to know themselves and to grow into the art is uh, it's spectacular. And I'm, I'm really grateful. That's all. I could speak for hours on this. Thank you. So, um, well, socially and, or politically or... I, I served on a board uh, of, a, of an organization called Victory Over Violence for nine years, and um, it was a very active participation. I went to a lot of women's shelters and, and participated in, in, uh, with women who needed surgery because of violence and you know, all, all, all that goes along with, with, with abuse. And um, that was really important to me because I have experienced that myself. Um, and it was a great way for me to give back and um, uh, utilize what I've learned and empathize with those who maybe hadn't yet. So that's that. Those are some of the things I do. And then, just in terms of me personally, I from the time I started, really truly, this is so true. Somehow, I was um, I was so motivated to illuminate the human condition through the roles of the women I got to play. It was so important to me. I'm talking about at 18. You know, it really, really mattered to me to um, explore not, not just for myself as an artist, but for the people that would hopefully see what I was doing, some aspect of the human condition that maybe they weren't familiar with and had no relationship to. That was really important to me, and it continues to be um, uh, the guiding force of whatever I, I find myself doing. Thank you. Um, this, this, is, this is kind of a hard question, and it's something that I'm still trying to kind of figure out, because I feel like um, I've always been somewhat a little bit shy or scared sometimes in life, and... I, this year I kind of had like a lot change and a lot happen or last year I should say um, and I kind of one of the things that I learned most about myself last year was uh, to kind of not shy away and be scared to just talk about my own experiences because that can actually help other people which is not something I ever really thought about or really thought was even all that valuable I guess um, but just taking the time to stop and talk to someone can actually help, which is crazy um, in my mind, because you never really think of yourself and your experiences as doing that. But that was kind of interesting for me. Um, and then just getting, I've gotten to meet a lot of people and get involved in different kind of organizations, which is really cool. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I, now sponsor a child, which is very exciting. <laughs> just things like that, which is kind of exciting that I have the ability to be able to do that stuff now. And um, I'm still trying to figure it out and grow and learn and, and really kind of reach out into the things that I really want to get involved in and I'm passionate about. And I think one of the things, I'm, I'm not scared to talk to directors so much anymore. I think when I started, I was like, okay, I'll you just go in, you do what you want, and then when you work with someone that actually wants to collaborate with you, you, you realize you're allowed to have a voice and an opinion, and you get to have a say in how you are portrayed and how women are portrayed and your own story and your own experiences. And bringing that into film, I think, is important because we need to see different stories. We need to see real perspectives and not necessarily just perspectives from 
maybe a guy who hasn't experienced what you have and the character that you're trying to portray. So um, speaking up has kind of been a big thing for me. Yeah. Professionally, I think <laughs> in my mind, I've always been a character actress trapped in a leading lady's body <laughs> because I've always gone out af for roles that were always more interesting and more complex and I never wanted to be that, you know, that sex symbol that you accused me of being. <laughs> um, so that's sort of what I did in just my profession, just for my own life. But then just personally, um, I'm a huge mental health advocate. Um, six years ago, my son was diagnosed with bipolar. And I immediately, it was, it was a really hard time for us to go through as a family. But as soon as we sort of came out of the other side of the crisis, I just immediately wanted to share my experiences with everyone else because I felt so alone going through it. I was felt alone in the medical industry. I felt alone. It was like, there's, there, nobody's put out a pathway <laughs> that you follow, you know? And um, I just wanted to sort of go to the highest mountain and let everybody know that these are our experiences and um, you can live a very healthy, happy life with any diagnosis. And so my family and I are big advocates. So that's very important to me and I'm absolutely not ashamed and I want everyone to speak about it because the statistics are one in four people will be, will experience some form of a mood disorder or mental illness in their life. One in four and that's only what's being reported now with very underreporting, so mm -hmm. we all have someone in our family or our s close circle of friends that's dealing with it. So I didn't ask this question because I have a Martin Luther King quote in mind, but I do. Um, <laughs> uh, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So just thinking about being a teacher, I just feel like my impulse is to just really want to keep pulling out the truth and not stop until I do, even if it takes years. I just want people to be all of who they are, and I kind of believe if they are, the world might be chaotic, but I believe it will be better and okay. So it's just to keep pulling people out of who they think they should be into who they really are. Well, that's something that, um, like Abby said, you've always taught us from the beginning of when I started teaching with Zach, and is that um, we used to write and, and, and say, well, as him teaching us to be activists, what enrages us and what ignites us and what is inside of us that we're passionate about because we need to focus on that and speak about that and, and really make that um, what we are going to fight for. Not to say that we can't fight for everything, but I think that really finding your strength in what you believe in is important as well. So thank you. Uh, I, uh, per personally, I volunteer a lot. Uh, I have a, a organization that I work with, Padres Contra el Cancer. So it's you know young children who have cancer, and I go to the hospital, I adopt families for the holidays. Uh, I'm a big Planned Parenthood uh, um, supporter. Uh, um, and, and any opportunity I have to do this, I'll do it. Because I'm from the inner city, and I so want everybody to know that they can do anything. And anything can happen. And so to me, it's so important to talk anytime somebody asks me to talk. <laughs> <laughs> is not easy. I'm sitting here in a puddle. I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm kind of weeping the last Aww. listening to all of you. And I'm also sitting in a puddle because <laughs> 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 That's I, spilled my water. I spilled my water like half an hour ago. I'm just sitting in a puddle. <laughs> but what I want for me, it's it's very simple. It's kindness. It's being kind to yourself so that you can be kind, uh, kind to others. And you know, to hear you say, Leslie, on how you were so scared and frightened and terrified with all this talent, 
And you were so lucky, and I don't really believe much in luck. I believe you got yourself to where you got yourself because you're so brilliantly talented. And to have that much fear, that just that also just breaks my heart. And so the kindness of being kind to yourself and taking care of yourself and being healthy so that you can then properly give to others is very important. Being kind, I think, will make everyone else kind around you. Thank you for doing this. Do our work. 